couple of months ago, my husband and I were road tripping across the United States. At 3 a.m., we stopped at a run-down gas station in the middle of nowhere. By the middle of nowhere, I mean the middle of nowhere. The gas station was the only building in the area, and it was surrounded by empty fields. It was maybe two miles off the interstate. At 3 a.m., it was pitch black outside, and the lights at the gas station were the only thing that illuminated the area. Since the gas station was closed, we were the only people there. My husband filled up the Jeep, and we spent a few minutes rummaging through our bags because I couldn't find my purse. After a while, an SUV pulled up right next to us. The driver was a man in his late 20s or early 30s. At that point, I was sitting in the passenger seat and my husband was about to get into the driver's seat. The man approached my husband and said, I lost my phone here. Have you seen it? Suddenly, a sense of dread filled the pit of my stomach as I noticed that he already had a phone, a flip phone on his hip. I studied his face. While he looked unassuming, there was something off about him, something sinister. I must have left it in that field over there. The field was pitch black. Can you help me look for it? My husband already had his iPhone out with his flashlight on. He's such a good Samaritan. He started to follow the man. Quickly, I whipped out my phone and texted him. Leave. My husband immediately saw the text and turned around to look at me. I must have looked terrified because he ran and jumped back into the car and we booked it out of there. As we were leaving, I looked back and saw the man get into his SUV. We drove for about 20 miles on the interstate to a rest stop and slept there. After a short time, my husband woke me up and told me to look through the passenger side window. The man had pulled up right next to us. There were some empty parking spaces at the rest stop and he still parked next to us. The creepy part is that we were parked at the very end of the rest stop, and the spot next to us wasn't a parking space. We had our seats down to help us sleep, so he probably didn't see us in our Jeep. We quietly watched him get out of his car, look over our Jeep, and walk into the building, probably looking for us. As soon as he entered the building, we snapped our seats back up, and hauled ass out of there. We drove for about 50 miles and found a hotel about 6 miles north of the interstate. We never saw him again. In the summer of 1999, my family and I took a trip to Yosemite National Park. While at the park, we stayed at a motel called the Cedar Lodge. It was a nice place in a remote part of the park. My 15-year-old self came down with a huge fever, and instead of infecting everyone else, my mother decided to get a separate room for me. So I'm laying around in bed, sick as a dog, when my AC stops working. I called up the front desk and asked them to come fix the stupid thing. A short while later, the door just magically opens and in comes this gruff looking man with a very distinct handlebar mustache. After entering, he proceeds to just stare at me. I remember being pretty scared, but I noticed he was in the motel uniform with a tool bag, so he must be there to fix the AC. He didn't say a single word. He swiftly moved over to the AC unit, knelt down, and began fixing it. Every few minutes he would turn around and look at me, like I was a piece of meat. The entire time, he never said one word. After he was finished, he walked to the door and stopped as if he was going to say something. But he didn't. He just closed the door and that was that. Fast forward a few days later, we arrive back in Florida after a great trip, besides me getting sick of course, and my grandparents and I were watching TV the main story for the program we were watching was a serial killer that was caught in Yosemite National Park. 
I immediately started getting a strange sensation in my spine. They said his name was Carrie Stainer. Then, a picture of the Cedar Lodge appeared on the television. At this point, I'm about to wet myself because I know I'm going to see that mustache on the next screen. Evidently, he murdered four women right before we traveled to the park. To this day, I still get shivers when I think about it. I was all alone with that man. He could have easily killed me. It's strange when I think about those gazes he gave me, probably contemplating where he would bury my body. About six years ago, my neighbors went out of town, and I was tasked with feeding their fish, as well as taking care of the house and the pool. This also meant that I could use the pool whenever I wanted, so naturally I did what any 20-year-old would do, and brought my girlfriend of the time over there at night. It was a nice summer night with no wind. The moon was out with no clouds. We couldn't figure out how to turn on the pool lights, so we said screw it and went in anyway. With the moon being so clear and bright, it was as if the light was on anyway. The only thing this changed was that the water looked like a sheet of black glass in the light. Imagine a peanut-shaped pool where on one end is me and my girl swimming in the shallow end, and on the other side is the deep end with the water slide. We were swimming along, not doing anything wrong, maybe just hugging a bit and talking. We both stopped dead when we heard deep breathing. We both looked to the deep end of the pool where the sound was coming from. In the moonlight, we could see a black silhouette of a head sticking out of the pool right by the water slide. The noise was coming directly from the shape. Normally that would be enough to scare someone, but the part that freaked us out was the feeling that we both got. It was a feeling like someone twisted a knife in our gut, like something extremely evil and wrong was there, and we needed to leave. We didn't get away though, we stood there in fear, looked back at each other, looked back at the shape, and it was gone. No ripples in the water, no lighting changes, just gone, and with it went the noise. We both got out and tried to see if there was someone in the pool with us that we didn't notice. Nothing. We both grabbed our towels and then ran like we have never run before. As I was running out of their backyard, my girlfriend was ahead of me. I crossed into the front yard when I felt two hands push on my shoulder blades that made me face plant into the grass. No one was there. After all these years, I tell people that it wasn't the head, the noise, or the push that scared me the most. It was the gut-wrenching feeling of something being wrong that did. My ex will still not talk about it to this day. I was playing with walkie-talkies as a kid. Those old 70s mega-sized walkie-talkies. It's summer. I'm with my brother and three friends. We're all about 12 years old. Suddenly, a stranger's voice comes across them and begins talking to us. It's obvious it was a nearby guy messing with us, but he did it in a real sadistic way that still gives me the chills. I basically tell myself it was a really sick joke or a prank. He was a grown man, not a kid or young adult. He told us all what we were wearing and where we lived, and how he was going to kill us all. He mentioned what my friend was wearing the day before, and not currently, so we knew that it was real and that he was stalking us. All in a super calm, serious, monotone voice. No laughter or, I'm gonna scare these kids kind of tones. He knew us by name and residence but also details that seemed very observant. Details like when and who we last played at the basketball court with, as well as what we wore at the court. The last time we went swimming, 
One was that my buddy loved orange creamsicles. He would grab one whenever we went to the corner store. That's all fine, but the two areas weren't in eyeshot of each other. For him to know this, he would have had to follow us. Stuff like that, specific and observant. He really knew the youngest of us. I'll call him Billy. He knew everything about Billy and what he did. Even the stuff we just did on a whim in relative outdoor privacy. So not a parent or anyone but someone that was watching us would know. Still, it wasn't what he said as much as how. Listen to how the Zodiac Killer spoke on the phone, and that's exactly how he sounded. He just suddenly stopped, too. No, see you soon, or something similar. He just stopped after we tried to go back and forth, figuring out who he was. When he stopped, he didn't totally stop, though. He just stopped responding to anything we said or did. We went from, haha, who is this, to, no, really, who is this? to pretending not to be horrified. He just stopped talking eventually. We all stayed together at my house that night, and on a dare, we turned on our walkie-talkies about two hours later. We didn't speak into it, just listened. It was completely silent except for sounds he clearly wanted us to hear that he would broadcast every ten minutes or so. The sound of walking around as he whistled a creepy tune or what sounded like knives sharpening or rubbing on each other. After an hour or so of just listening to these bursts, he stops in the middle of whatever he was doing in one burst transmission and says, It won't be tonight. You can all go to bed now. Smart to stick together. Smart. Then that was it. Never another direct transmission, but we thought we heard similar random sounds. About three days later, a five-minute burst of a chair rocking or wood creaking or something. Adults got home about an hour after that, and we explained it all. They took it as some asshole messing around, basically saying, Relax, you're fine, go to bed. But it really messed with our heads. I think they thought we were exaggerating. Something on a deep level was very disturbing about it. It wasn't kids being scared of the boogeyman. It was my first taste of what I'd call real sickness. I've dreamt about it a couple times this year alone, dozens over the years. His vocal demeanor was worse than what he said, how he would kill us as the others watched and nobody would find us and depending on how good we were, he would decide if he'd go back to get others in our family and around the neighborhood. Specific, creepy stuff but told in a terrifyingly relaxed monotone. Horrible stuff he would say, but that tone, man. I hate to play off that as anything but a sick guy being sick and messing with us, but a couple years after a young boy did die nearby, he suddenly couldn't be found, and then he was found nearby a couple hours later. About a decade after that, another kid around the same age was horribly murdered and it's never been solved. It made the national news. No connection other than the town and general area, but it leaves very little doubt in my mind. I told the police this story in hopes it narrowed the location of a suspect or place to look for one. You really had to hear his voice and what he said as he knows who you are, but you have no idea who it is. Zero idea. It felt like a guy being honest. It's just how it felt then, and now. You had to be there. My mom and I were living in a small house in Laguna Beach back in the early 80s. My mom was out of town and I was home alone. Before I went to bed, I made sure to lock all the doors and windows, because this was when Richard Ramirez was terrorizing Southern California. I woke up in the middle of the night, because my dog, who was sleeping on the bed with me, started to growl. I looked to see why he was growling, and I could see the figure of someone standing in the kitchen, 
staring into my bedroom. I could not make out any features or even clothing. It was just a dark shape. They didn't move or make any noise, just stood there. I ducked under the covers in terror and the dog jumped off the bed and ran out of the room. I couldn't hear anything and eventually after hours fell asleep. When I woke up in the morning, I double-checked all the doors and windows, but they were all still locked. My dog was outside on the back porch. About ten years ago, I had just started dating this girl that I had a massive crush on. We were fresh out of high school and her parents went out of town for a weekend. I was going to finally stay at her house that night, and I was amped. I have a bit of trouble sleeping in a new place, so I was awake after she had already fell asleep. I tried to keep my eyes closed and let sleep come naturally. Just as I started to drift off, I heard a sound like scratching on wood, quick and getting faster. I opened my eyes and oriented myself again. It wasn't scratching. It was whispering, and it was getting louder. My girlfriend was staring at me and was rapidly whispering, She is the devil in disguise. She is the devil in disguise. She is the devil in disguise. The whispering continued until she stopped mid-sentence. She is the devil in disguise. She is the devil. He can't help you. She closed her eyes and rolled over, leaving me with a very, what the hell, feeling. I asked her about it in the morning, and she said she used to talk in her sleep a lot as a kid. I still have no idea if she was messing with me, or if it was real, but it was easily the most terrifying thing I've ever seen. I don't believe in ghosts, but there was something that awoke me in the middle of the night when my family and I were in our cabin in the mountains, far from civilization. I didn't see anything, but I woke up with a start. I couldn't move. I held my breath out of fear. Sleep paralysis, maybe. Suddenly, I heard my mother from the adjacent room whisper my name, as if trying to get my attention. I'm too paralyzed to reply. I eventually fall asleep. The following morning my mother said she saw me sleepwalking. My sister said that she too awoke with a start and she'd also seen me walk by her bedroom. I don't sleepwalk. I had been in my bed the entire time. This was probably 10 years ago. I was about 13 years old. I was at my house with my brother, who was around 11 years old, and our two friends and neighbors who were brothers and the same age as us. Both our parents and their parents had gone out together for the evening. Our house has large double front doors. The second of the two doors, which is hardly used, has the locking mechanism where you have to unlatch it along the bottom of the door frame to open it. The main door is your standard front door. We were playing video games in the basement when I decided to let our dog out. I went upstairs, unlocked the main door, let her out, and shut the door and locked it. I went back downstairs and we continued to play whatever it was we were playing. I totally lost track of time and my friend, who I'll call Steve, noticed that our dog was sitting next to the couch we were on. I was confused thinking perhaps our parents had just returned, as I hadn't gone back up to let her in. I went upstairs, calling for my parents, to which there was no response, and noticed both of the front doors were wide open. So not only had the main one been unlocked and opened, but the latch on the second had been undone, and that door had also been opened. I was terrified. I slammed both doors shut and locked them, grabbed the home phone, sprinted downstairs, and let the others know what happened. We hunkered up in a spare bedroom, called our parents, 
and they immediately left where they were to head home. Nothing ever came of it. To this day, I still have no way of explaining it, but it was terrifying. My wife and I were out camping back in 2012. We had spent 52 nights in the backwoods that year. Every weekend we would camp on Vancouver Island and enjoy the solitude. We were on a beach a good distance from anywhere. To get to the trail to leave the beach was a kilometer along the beach and two kilometers to the road through the forest. There was nobody there except a guy named Leon from New Zealand that we met earlier on the beach that was planning on sleeping in his van up the road. We invited him down to the beach to join us by our fire, and we brought a bottle of wine that we could share. He came out and we talked about all kinds of things. We kept hearing female voices from what sounded like behind us in the bushes. I had figured out it was just someone who had anchored offshore and the sound was bouncing in a weird way. All of us acknowledged that we could hear the voices. It was getting late, so Leon hiked out to his van, and we stoked the fire because my wife was creeped out. We stayed up very late, and the voices had stopped, so we decided to put out the fire and go to bed. We had scanned the cove with a flashlight several times, looking for boats that could be the source of the talking. It must have been 3 a.m. About 15 minutes after we lay down, we heard footsteps in our camp area over by where the fire was. They came from the direction of the bushes toward inland behind us. That direction was not traversable by people. We just lay there, hoping it was a bear or something, because the island had black bears, but they were easy to deal with. The footsteps went from the fire and then over to our tent, but then back into the woods. Five minutes later, the footsteps go back to the fire with two female voices talking gibberish very loudly. They are having a discussion at full volume in the dead of night, very far away from civilization, without using lights to navigate through dense brush, relatively quietly, in a direction that we considered impassable. After they were done at the fire pit area, they walked over to our tent, still talking at loud volume. We couldn't make out anything they were saying. It was gibberish. They stood over us and talked for a few seconds and then went completely dead as night, silent. Then, they went back into the woods, never to be seen or heard again. We just lay there completely frozen, afraid, for who knows how long. We woke up around 11 a.m. the next day because we had such a late night. That was the last night we stayed outside for at least a year. I was working at a hotel in Albuquerque, the graveyard shift. I had been talking to the security guard and he asked if he could get a ride home. So instead of waiting for 30 minutes for my shift to end, I just left and left a note for my boss that said I left early because my brother was stranded outside of town and needed me to pick him up. It was a total lie on my part, but I needed a good excuse to leave early. I drop off the security guard at his place and then go home and go to sleep. A couple of hours of sleep and I wake up to my phone ringing. It was my brother. He tells me he is stranded outside of town and he needs me to pick him up. I tell my brother the lie I told my boss and how much of a coincidence it is that he's calling me and saying this. He says that's not weird at all. He will show me what's weird when I get there. I get there and ask him what is weird. He puts his phone up to my ear and plays a message that he got when he woke up that morning. It's a voice that kinda sounded computerized but mostly just creepy as hell. It said, you're stuck. Freaked us both out. Never figured out where the call came from. Strangest, creepiest thing that's ever happened to me in my life.
When I was little, I would go over to my grandparents' house frequently with my sister and my cousins. My grandparents have an attached mother-in-law apartment, so we always played in there while the grown-ups would talk in the main house. One day, we were playing hot and cold with a little key we found in the apartment. While one person was hiding it, they accidentally dropped it and it fell under the door to the basement. I opened the door to get it, and when I did, there was a man standing at the bottom of the stairs that I didn't recognize. When he saw me, he yelled, Close the door. I was so freaked out, I bolted and immediately ran into the main house to tell my parents. My dad went into the basement to look, but couldn't find anyone. To this day, they all tell me that I imagined it, but my sister and cousins insist that it was real. About five years later, both of my grandparents passed away, so I was helping my dad clean out their basement. It turns out, they were missing a lot of stuff. I haven't gone back in that house since. When I was in 8th grade, my parents separated. Basically, my mom packed her and I up one night, and we moved into my grandpa's and didn't look back. We ended up living there through my high school years. When he died, my parents officially got divorced. My mom remarried, and we moved into the city with my stepfather. My grandpa lived on the first floor of the apartment and the owners, an elderly couple who were family to us through marriage, lived on the second floor. The property also had a small in-law cottage out in the back where my uncle lived. For some reason that I will never understand, there was no lock to get into the actual building if you entered through the back. The back door opened into a landing where there was a locked and deadbolted door to our apartment and then two sets of stairs. One led up to the also locked and deadbolted door of the second floor apartment and the other led down to the basement where there was also no lock. Our apartment could also be entered from the front of the building but in order to access the second floor apartment or the basement you had to go through this landing. The basement was actually pretty nice and at one point they had started to convert it into its own apartment before they ultimately decided to make the in-law cottage instead. So in the basement, there was a full kitchen complete with an oven, a sink, and a refrigerator. The washer and dryer, which was shared by all of us, was also in the basement, as well as just some general storage stuff. The basement was entirely open except for a back room that was full of storage. It had one of those kind of swinging saloon type doors where you can see above and beneath them. The storage area was longer than it was deep so you couldn't really see anything much behind the doors aside from shelves. You had to walk in them and turn to really see the room. One night when I was in high school, I think I was 15 at the time, after taking a shower I saw that the laundry bin in the bathroom was pretty full, so I grabbed a ton of laundry and headed down towards the basement. It was pretty late at night, but I figured I would at least get it started and move some things over in the morning. I tossed everything onto the ground and started sorting out colors when I got hit with a horrible feeling in my gut. The basement was not at all a creepy basement. It was well lit and pretty welcoming with the kitchen and everything, but for some reason that I can't explain, something just started to feel wrong. Anyone who has ever been hit with the feeling that they were being watched knows exactly what I'm talking about. I don't know how or why it came over me, but it was something that I couldn't shake, and I found myself looking over the saloon doors and the only part of the basement that I couldn't see in its entirety. I don't know why, maybe just to assure myself I was being a big baby, I started to walk towards the back room, but stopped myself just as I reached out towards the swinging doors. 
I've been a horror fan for as long as I can remember and had seen more horror movies than I could count. And I knew that if that was a movie, I would be calling myself a dumbass and saying not to go into that back room. I quickly snapped my hand back and ran up the stairs, leaving all the clothes behind, and into our apartment where I locked the doors and immediately told my mom that I just had the worst feeling in the basement and that I was super creeped out. Despite me not being the type of person that scares easily, she basically rolled her eyes at me and told me to go to bed. I ended up doing as I was told, though it took me a bit to shake the feeling and finally fall asleep. Later that night, my bladder woke me up and I stumbled out of my room to go to the bathroom. I didn't turn any of the lights on as I started making my way towards the bathroom because it usually woke up my grandpa and I didn't want to bother him. When I got closer to the bathroom, I noticed my mom standing in the doorway of her bedroom and something looked off and it took me a moment to realize that she was clutching the phone. She then noticed me and whispered to me to get against the wall, which I did without hesitation. It took a few moments for the grogginess to wear off and my eyes to adjust to the darkness before I could see what she did. My mom's bedroom was immediately off of the kitchen. The kitchen was where the back door that led to the landing and the basement was located. The door had a tiny window up top with a small but thick curtain. It was thin enough that you could see that someone was outside of the door, but thick enough to not be able to make out any of the features of the person on the other side. But there was someone on the other side of the door, and every now and then, the doorknob would move, and you could hear this scratching sound was on the other side. I have never been so afraid in my entire life. I'm not sure how I managed to do what I did next. It was like someone else had taken control over me entirely. I slid down against the wall that I was clinging to and started to crawl against it in the darkness towards the kitchen. My mom looked petrified watching back and forth between me and the back door. She kept whispering for me to stop and go back, but I kept moving forward, low and against the wall towards the counter where I carefully grabbed a butcher knife. I was shaking the whole time I moved with the knife in my hand on the ground next to the fridge, which was next to the door the man was trying to get into. I had this horrible feeling that I was going to be killed, but if I was, I wasn't going to go down without a fight. It felt like I sat there forever in the darkness next to the door with my mom hiding in the bedroom doorway across from me, just waiting. But it was only for a few minutes. My mom had already called 911 before I had woken up and stumbled my way towards the bathroom. The lights from approaching squad cars soon filled the kitchen, and from the other side of the door, I could hear a sudden clamoring and commotion and the slam of the back screen bursting open as the would-be assailant took off running. It was around 3 a.m. when this happened, so it was completely dark outside, and we lived right by some train tracks and very thick bushes and trees that made it easy for the man to escape the cop that pursued him. The police came in and took statements from my mom and I. My grandpa, who was partially deaf, had managed to sleep through almost the entire thing until the police came through to search the apartment and make sure that we were okay. The outside of the door and the doorknob were both covered in deep scratches, like someone had been going at it with a knife, trying to figure out how to get in, but that wasn't the most horrifying part to me. That was reserved for the basement. The clothes that I had brought down were not where I had left them, and they had been thrown about and disheveled, and the back room the one with the swinging door that I had stopped myself from going in, the boxes that were out of view had also been thrown about, all opened, obviously gone through with some things missing, and there were some wrappers from food on the floor. He had been down there looking for something to steal. He was down there 
When I went down to do laundry, I had almost walked into that room, and based on what we had seen on the door, he had a knife. To this day, I can't help but find myself sometimes thinking about what would have happened if I had walked into that room. This summer started off with a trip to a very prestigious university for what is basically nerd camp. Most people were actually very lovely except for a handful of rather strange sex starved or just plain socially awkward individuals who made comments that would send chills down almost anyone's spine. For example, one boy made a comment about how we really shouldn't have any qualms about secretly injecting people's water supply with numerous biological chemicals as a means of testing what is suitable for biological warfare. Another brought a roll of what looked like 10,000 condoms and eagerly showed my roommate and I in a coffee shop with the biggest grin on his face. One of my three roommates also had a particular habit of waking up in the wee hours of the morning, getting dressed, hopping back to bed, and then darting out the door without even a hello as soon as any of us had woken up. The only real physical issues I had were at the final dance when us biochemical kids were introduced to the engineers. I hate to bag on them, since most of my brother's friends, including his wife, are engineers, but these kids were ridiculously creepy. I was followed the whole night by one kid who kept trying to teach me how to feel the beat in my veins and had my wrists grabbed by other kids I met on the first day. This isn't even the worst of it. I have yet to introduce Brett. Brett was what my roommates and I described as the dictionary definition of a tall douchebag upon first impressions. He stuck out like a sore thumb amongst a sea of acne-ridden teens with oversized glasses and pants that were too big for their belts. He came from money, unlike most of us, and liked to let everyone know how superior he was to everyone. He sat alone on all the bus rides, and until my roommate and I finally approached him, he only mingled with his fellow Pennsylvanians. He liked to brag about how long it would take him to get ready and he probably spent more time on his hair than any girl he knew. He was ridiculously good looking, and he knew it. On one particular bus ride, the two of us managed to be stuck together when we got on late. His response was rude. Man, I don't know if I can do this. I read silently next to him as he scrolled through his Instagram pics, glancing over. I saw him with another girl in formal attire, most likely for a dance. I saw this as an opportunity to initiate small talk and asked if he had a girlfriend. Nah, none of those are really my dates. He showed me his Facebook pictures of him with other girls in other fancy outfits. There were close to a dozen, and to be honest, I hated all of these girls. He then showed me some pictures of him at concerts, parties, and other random places, all with a different girl by his side. They're so dumb, he continued. I know they're like me, but I just hate them all. I usually take them out when I'm bored and we get hammered and hook up, but that's it. I could never date any of them. Hell, I can't even hook up when I'm sober. I was past the point of being slightly uncomfortable. The way he spoke about these girls was beyond messed up. He described several hooking ups in very intricate details and referred to the girls as though they were pieces of meat. Then the real crazy talk began. I like to take these girls out to parties and get them super drunk. I take care of them at first, help them to their bathroom, hold their hair back when they throw up. Then I like to pull them back and shove them in their vomit, kick their face in, spit on them and tell them to go kill themselves. These girls, you know, they're so dumb. 
If I hadn't been so shocked by the words he just said, I probably would have said something like, What's wrong with you? You disgusting piece of shit. But all I could respond with was a stare equally as emotionless as his. I think he found that intriguing. Maybe a little comforting. Maybe a little attractive because the rest of his trip was spent in my presence. He would often talk to me about how I was different, how I wasn't like other girls, how I didn't give a shit just like him. He would tell me his stories about belittling and dehumanizing women, as though I admired them. To be honest, I didn't say much because I didn't even know how to respond. He was a maniac, and he really got off on treating girls like shit. We had the strangest level of friendship because I was so disgusted with him and at the same time he was an attractive person. He was extremely charismatic and had a great sense of humour and was extremely intelligent. But there was something off about him and it was only because of what he had disclosed with me that I felt I was able to pick up on it. His eyes, piercing blue, were so empty and cold. When talking about personal topics or tragic events, he never missed a beat, with a sympathetic reply, but it was so disingenuous. I discussed the topic with my roommates, and we came to the conclusion that Brett was a sociopath, a narcissistic sadist, or some other type of psychopath, and with no matter how attractive, we should all stay away. After the camp ended, I never thought I would see him again and he would simply be a creepy story to tell my friends. However, that was not the case. My final trip of the summer, you better believe it, was to accompany my best friend Pamela on her annual trip to visit her dad in Pennsylvania. Somewhere in those wooded forests lurked a monster by the name of Brett. I had no intention of meeting up with him, but I did plan on meeting up with one of his friends, Drew. We had hit it off during camp, sharing many of the same interests and hobbies. He told me that before we left, if I were ever in Pennsylvania or DC, I should let him know, and he would be more than happy to meet up. Although he and Brett hung out at camp, I knew that they weren't friends back home. They were far too different. Drew was a freckly, paper-white ginger who was about 5 foot 10, and about 135 pounds at most. He played video games and hiked for fun, not to mention Brett specifically told me that he hated Drew. Apparently, Brett believed Drew was trying way too hard to be like him, and this was most definitely untrue. So Drew, Pamela and I go hiking around his town. I don't ask about Brett when Drew mentions him, but my best friend is dying to meet him after everything I told her. Drew says he can invite us to a party, and then we can all catch up. We ended up going since apparently Pamela thought spending the night making venison jerky wasn't a preferable alternative to meeting up with a crazed individual. The party ends up being something out of a nightmare, raging college kids and a shit ton of drugs. All the stuff that would make me want to hide in a corner. Pamela was having a blast, and so far I imagined to avoid consuming any of the drinks Brett was shoving in my hand. He was staying way too close to me the whole night, trying to pull me onto him when we sat on couches, grazing my ass whenever I stood near him, and at one point he pressed against the wall and forcibly kissed my neck, before his not date came around and got very pissy with the both of us. I hid from him for the rest of the night. Eventually, the party began breaking up, because someone got wind that the cops were coming. Drew was rushing me to the car but I couldn't find Pamela anywhere. I looked in the bathroom and found Pamela flipping her shit and dragging me to the tub. There in the tub was Brett State. She was surrounded by vomit and her face and lips were palish blue. The both of us began freaking out because she wasn't breathing. I called Drew and he raced into the house and the three of us dragged her out the front and called an ambulance. Drew was pretty stoned, but told us to wait in the car, and he would explain everything to the cops since he didn't want to get us in trouble. The cops came and questioned everyone at the scene, 
the girl was taken away and Pamela ended up having to call her dad to pick us up. The next day I called Drew and he told me the girl was alright. She had also spoken to Brett who seemed completely unfazed by everything. Apparently she passed out whilst they were fooling around in the basement so we took the liberty of dumping her in the bathtub where he knew someone would find her since she was his friend. Then he split because he didn't want to get into any trouble for drinking underage. I know the world is a pretty messed up place and people can be downright evil but to witness this first hand is rather nauseating. Brett is only 18 and it terrifies me to think about what he's capable of. Imagine in a few years. So I truly hope I never have to look into your soulless eyes again. This is without a doubt the most terrifying thing that has ever happened to me. I have only told a few people, but I feel like I need to share it in case it helps any students abroad to be more cautious. So a bit of background first. This happened to me about five years ago when I was 19 and studying abroad in Italy. Our school had its own campus about an hour outside of Rome, in a quiet town where the Pope has a summer place. Part of our school's program in Italy was that we'd had to leave campus for 10 days to vacation and explore Europe in October. Everyone would split off into their friends groups and travel. I didn't really have a group that I was attached to, but not wanting to go by myself I asked these two girls that I was friendly with if I could travel with them. They were best friends and roommates and were nice enough and said that I could go with them. We decided to travel from Rome to Austria, Prague and Germany via Eurorail which is the train service. We went the entire trip having fun and without incident until the last day which is where my awful experience begins. On our last day we were in Munich meeting up with most of our class as a school tradition of sorts. The two girls that I was traveling with and myself had tickets to take the overnight train that night to Rome from Munich which left around midnight. During the day one of the girls tells me that she had changed her plans 10 days ago before we left and was going to stay in Munich overnight and come back the next day. Which was a surprise to me, but I still wasn't that worried because she was going to be joining up with our classmates and staying in a booked hostel with them and I would still be traveling with this other girl. Then, much to my dismay, the other girl says that she is changing her mind and is going to be staying overnight in Munich as well. I asked her when she'd planned to stay as she hadn't booked a room in a hostel. She said that she would sneak into the hostel and share a bed with the other girl. I told her that I was really uncomfortable traveling alone and that it wasn't fair for her to abandon me like that. She told me nonchalantly that I could find a hostel and book another ticket if I cared so much. I told her that I didn't have extra money to pay for a separate ticket back to Rome, let alone a hostel in addition to that, as I was a college student on a very tight budget and had already spent a lot on this trip and didn't have that much in my bank account. Despite my pleas, those petty girls essentially said that it was not their problem and ditched me. Luckily, we had already met up with another group of our classmates who helped bad for me and spent the entire last day of our vacation running around all of Munich to try and find a hostel to stay that night and even offered to pull together money to help me buy a ticket back. Unfortunately, it was Oktoberfest in Germany and literally every hostel was completely booked and despite my attempts to sneak into my friend's hostel with them, I was stopped and thrown out. At this point it's night time. I was defeated 
and worried, but my other classmates who had tried to help me were still sticking with me. I figured at this point the only options I had were to sleep outside on a bench in Munich, totally unsafe and ridiculous, or take the overnight train to Rome by myself. Not super safe, but I figured that I'd be around other people, so maybe not completely awful. So I decided to go ahead and take the overnight train back to Rome by myself, and my classmates walked me to the station and saw me on the train. Unsurprisingly enough, those guys ended up being some of my closest friends in the years to come. But anyway, so now I'm on this overnight train by myself. I head to my carriage, and the way it was set up was in a room off a hallway with six seats. No beds, because I was trying to save money. I was the first one in my carriage, so I sit next to the window on one side, and I pull my giant backpacker's pack, which was my only luggage, on the seat next to me. Eventually, two German guys in their 30s come in and are polite enough to sit opposite me. They converse with each other and they've got their suitcases and are looking at maps of Rome and tourist things to do. I feel safe enough with these guys since they are minding their own business. But this is where things get bad. I settle in to listen to music and try to sleep for a little bit. And perhaps after an hour or so, I start to notice that there's a super sketchy guy standing right outside our carriage, in the middle of the hallway staring at me. I'm completely freaked out, because 1. No one is supposed to be in the hallway just standing there. You're either on your way to the loo, or heading back to your own carriage. Why would you just stand there staring at someone? 2. He didn't break eye contact with me once when I looked at him. He just kept staring at me with a sinister look on his face like he wanted to eat me up. So I'm kind of freaking out, and try to look away and pretend like I really didn't notice him. I wait a bit to see if he was just a normal guy going to or from the loo or something. But when I look back, he's still there. He hasn't moved, and is still leering at me from behind the window door of my carriage. I want to go shut the curtains to our carriage so that he can't look in, but I don't want to get too close to piss him off or anything. So I turn to the two German guys and quietly tell them that the guy there is creeping me out, and staring at me, and making me uncomfortable, and ask them if one of them could casually in a minute or so close the curtains. I had hoped they'd be men, and kind of protect me and tell the guy to bugger off or whatever, but they seemed annoyed that mumbled that they would, but never did. When I brought it up again, they were obviously pissed, but eventually did close the curtain. I thought that surely would... I thought that surely would have deterred the guy from lurking, and soon fell asleep. A few hours later, I awoke to three young Germans in their mid to late twenties join the carriage, in the remaining three seats. As they came in, I noticed that the creepy guy from before, is still there, standing outside the door. I kind of freak out inside, and really don't feel comfortable at all, and I'm a bit panicky. I try to talk to the younger Germans, but they weren't very friendly and perhaps didn't speak English very well. It had been hours at this point, and I noticed that I really have to pee. But the only way for me to get to the loo is to go outside the carriage and down the hallway to the loo at the very end of the train, a bit further away from other carriages with people. I noticed that when the younger Germans came in, they moved the curtain a bit, so I could see the creepy dude was standing there and kind of leering at me. He refuses to go away. I noticed that when people walk by to use the loo, he kind of just acts casual like he's waiting for someone or something, and looks away from my carriage. But once they're gone, he's back at it again. I try to hold it in for as long as I can, but this is a 12 hour train ride, and it would be another 4 hours or more before we made it to Rome, and there was no way I would be able to hold it in for that long. At this point, everyone in my carriage had been asleep for a long time, and I didn't want to wake anyone. I have to nudge the young Germans on my way out of the carriage to go to the loo. 
and I tried to tell them I'm going to the loo and they could just keep an eye on me and the creepy lurker and they brush me off like I'm a jerk for waking them and they go back to sleep. I exit the carriage and freaked out of my mind and also about to pee my pants and of course I basically run to the creepy dude standing outside my carriage. There's hardly any room in the hallway and he is not giving any space and just staring down at me and he's not giving me any space and is just staring down at me. I'm five foot four and he was towering over me at six foot two. So I do my best, book it to the loo as fast as I can and lock the door behind me. My heart is racing and I'm going as fast as I can so that hopefully he hasn't followed me there. But alas, I get out of the loo and he's right there with this disgusting smile on his face. I mean, I don't want to exaggerate, but there was evil in his eyes and it chilled me. I was sick to my stomach. I tried to squeeze by him quickly and he started to press himself against me. I gave him the nastiest face and yelled, let me go. And luckily there was a man heading to the loo just as he did that. So the creepy dude moved off and I booked it back to my carriage where I proceeded to stay for the remainder of the ride. I had thought that my outburst and little scene I caused would have deterred the sketchy guy from creeping on me anymore. But when I looked up at some point, he was right back there. He was in the hallway staring at me. At this point, I was kind of in disbelief that someone could be so blatantly leecherous. And I started to wonder if there was actually a seat out in the hallway that was cheaper than a shared carriage. But I realized that when I'd left to go to the bathroom earlier, I had seen no seats and obviously it's a hazard. And I remembered another detail too. The guy had no luggage whatsoever. This was a 12 hour trip from Germany to Rome. So everyone in this train was either coming or going from work or a pleasure trip. But all of them had at least a small suitcase of some kind. So the fact that this guy had no luggage, no briefcase or anything on him and was just standing in the hallway staring at me made my stomach drop. This man did not have good intentions and I couldn't rationalize it in any other way. I spent the last hours or so of the trip devising my plan for once the train arrived back in Rome. I knew the train station there very well and I already knew that the metro system I needed to transfer to get back to my campus was down several flights of steps and around more than a few twists and turns. So I felt pretty confident that when the train stopped, I would have my backpack ready and go. The other Germans got out of the train and ahead of me and the creepy guy had to move for them to pass. So I quickly followed in between them and jumped off the train and booked it through the station without looking behind me. Thank God it was crowded in the station with people heading to work and I felt safe that I was disguised in the crowd. I flew down the flights of stairs and around the turns without stopping. When I finally got down to the platform for the metro station I needed, I felt safe. I was just catching my breath when I saw no one other than the creepy guy come down the stairs and look around for me. When he saw me, he had that evil, leecherous look in his eye and I wanted to cry. I grabbed tightly onto my pocket knife in my coat pocket and I made my way to a group of harmless looking Italians and tried to stand in with their group. They seemed annoyed that I was standing so close to them. Perhaps it was my giant backpack or my scared, sweaty, disheveled self. Who knows? I was standing still, about several train cars length away from him at this point, but he was starting to make his way over when the train pulled up. I hopped into my car and immediately tried to position myself near some folks who rudely kept scooting away from me. I noticed he got on a few cars away. As the car was moving, he made his way down the car into the next and with each stop the train made, he got a little closer to me. I myself moved a cars down away from him, but I grew increasingly worried that the further outside of the Metro Rome area the fewer people would be on the train and the closer he would get to me. 
When I had made it to the first car, I realized that I had nowhere else to go. I looked and noticed that he was only one car away and he was heading my way. As we pulled into the next stop, I grasped my pocket knife tightly and made a last ditch effort to evade him and got off the train. I looked to my right and saw to my horror that he had gotten off as well and was briskly running towards me. As the last few people shoved past me to get on the train, I realized that I had no other options and threw myself back and dove into the train without breaking eye contact with this sicko as the doors to the train closed in front of him and I realized I had made it safely onto the train, leaving him on the platform, fuming and yelling as the train sped off. Not really believing I had made it safely, I spent the rest of the metro ride still in fight or flight mode and dashed upstairs to my above ground bus up to my campus, making sure I was sitting next to a sweet old lady. The creepy dude never showed up on the bus and once I made it back inside my campus walls, I immediately fell to the ground and cried. I realized that I was so incredibly lucky that I had evaded what was probably certainly a kidnapping rape murder or something else. But I have never forgotten that man's face and the look in his eyes and how it made me feel. I wanted to peel my skin off and crawl under a rock and die. I ended up telling my ordeal to the dean of our campus and pleaded for him to reprimand those two girls who abandoned me and forced me into a compromising position which was totally unsafe. I wanted the dean to tell all students and future students that it's never okay to let someone travel alone, especially girls. And especially since most of us were young and felt invincible and were just plain naive and stupid and didn't know what was safe and what was not in a foreign country. But that weasel of a dean thought I was overreacting and that I was probably asking for it. Yeah. It was a school that victim blamed and thought leggings were impure and thought the girls who abandoned me were goody goodies. And I was some loose rebel who got myself into this position. I haven't heard anyone else at my school getting into situations like me, but I've made sure to tell all the girls and guys who are in my year and below to be careful when they study abroad and not do what those girls did to me. I hope it helps someone in some way. And if you ever see a man traveling alone on a long distance train without any luggage or a briefcase at all, be wary. As a humanist, I try to look for opportunities to help my fellow human, to being a living front of kindness and compassion, hopefully leaving the world nicer than when I found it. There is a thin line between kindness and naivety though. I also learned this the hard way. Three or four years ago I was 24 years old. I am a female, recently single and living happily alone. I left work at around 3 a.m. The joys of the service industry and happened to give a ride home to the co-worker who closed with me. It wasn't a bad part of town per se, but not the greatest. Whatever. Time to head home and get me some sleep. Patiently waiting at the red light, streets are void of cars and people. It's 3am of course. When I noticed a man and woman stumbling down the sidewalk to my right. The man knocks on my car window and I flinch. My car doesn't have electronic anything and my window was already down an inch. Maybe they needed help or something. Why else would they be staggering around at 3 a.m.? Her ankle is broken, she can't walk. The lady is kind of swaying just out of my view, moaning either in pain or inebriation. I frown. I can call you someone if you like. There's a gas station over there Maybe you could... The guy then opened my front passenger door, which my co-worker hadn't locked, and the woman stranger stepped into my car. It happened so fast, I was stunned. 
even more so when the guy squeezed in beside her. Two people somehow sitting in the front seat of my Toyota Corolla. I was suddenly conscious of the woman's leg pressing against my purse at her feet. Inside was my phone, my Kindle and my wallet. With all the hard earned money that I'd made in the past two weeks of waiting tables, which was my rent and more. They reeked of alcohol, with their eyes glazed. They are high as hell, and the guy tells me, You're gonna drive us to the Kruger. Y you mean the Walmart up the street? Drive! Just drive! Uh, okay, I stammered, and complied. Were they armed? I didn't want to find out. The guy was drinking something out of a bottle in a brown paper bag, like a class act. What would they do if I refused? They were clearly in an altered state. Unpredictable. Dangerous. Don't escalate. Don't provoke. I pressed my lips into a forced smile and decided that I would be as calm as possible and polite as I could possibly manage. And maybe they'd have second thoughts about murdering someone so nice or at least feel a little bad about it. They tried to engage me in conversation as we drove. The woman seemed to be about 40, leathery skin and quite manic. She would rattle off schizophrenic nonsense one minute and then become incredibly lucid and well spoken in a complex topic like computer science. Watching her go back and forth between the two states was truly surreal. She told me that I didn't need to be scared and that they weren't going to hurt me. They just needed a ride. I nodded and smiled and continued to scream internally. The man seemed much older than she was, in his 60s, bald, with wisps of white hair, maybe her uncle or her father. He would only speak by giving turn by turn directions and would absolutely lose his shit at me if I changed so much as a lane unexpectedly. As the neighbourhood deteriorated around us, I desperately scanned the roads for a police car on patrol. I would call attention to myself somehow, run a red light, honk, swerve at them, anything to draw attention, and I would be saved and no such luck. My passengers were becoming increasingly agitated and paranoid as we neared our destination. They could sense my fear because the woman began to play with my hair and stroke my cheek. Hey, don't be scared. I said we're not gonna hurt you, you're such a nice girl. She cooed in my ear. You're so nice, such a pretty girl. Holy shit, holy shit, the man chuckled. I see the Kruger across the street, but no, turn left they screamed at me, into the sketchiest apartment complex ever. My heart sank, this is how it ends, raped or dead, or both. They have me idle in the parking lot, and the guy gets out, I'ma be right back, make sure she doesn't get out, we got more stops after this. Ah hell no, the woman stays with me in the car and the guy disappears into one of the units. This is obviously a drug deal. I idly wonder if I'm guilty of a crime now, an accessory to something. I wonder if they tried to get me to come and party with them later or some shit. Not gonna happen. I knew that if they got out of my car, it would be the beginning of the end. Once the man leaves, the woman spreads out the passenger seat. I think she's just making herself comfortable until her legs part suggestively and she begins sexy slow dancing in my 2008 Toyota Corolla to my immortal by Evanescence. She looks over to me with the most lustful set of bedroom eyes. She bites her upper lip and her hand travels up her thigh and she asks me, do you like what you see? Is this really happening? Did she just proposition me? while sexy dancing to Evanescence, as if this night could not get more bizarre. Luckily my poker face is strong and I suppress any reaction. I break into an apologetic smile 
Oh no, but thank you. I don't swing that way. I hastily switch one of my everyday rings to my wedding finger and hold it up with a regretful smile. I'm married, you see. My husband is expecting me home soon. Her seductive demeanor drops like a curtain, her face twisting with fury and indignation. Uh, what do you think I am, some kind of hooker? It wasn't like that. I didn't mean it like that. Oh, no, no, no. I didn't think that at all. I'm sorry. I'm just very tired because I worked all day and it's late. She stares at me hard, eyes wide, and struggling to focus, until her face breaks into another wide manic smile. She slumps back into her chair, seemingly satisfied with my answer, and we share an uncomfortable silence. I had to do something. No way I was going to see how this night played out, with me and the two of them. My eyes dart to the unit the man went into, and I lean over to the woman, my face can mask of concern. Hey, he's been gone a long time. Do you think you should go check on him, make sure he's okay? Her eyes narrow, suspicious, and she gives me a wary smile. You won't just drive away. I summon every ounce of angelic calm and poured it into my voice. Of course not. Y you promise? Yes. I smiled warmly. I promise. Dying a little more inside. Imagine my surprise when it actually worked. I watch her get out of the car and close the door. I book it. Rubber screeching, heart pounding, it's dark so I don't bother looking back. I try leaving the complex but there's only one exit, the way that we came in. Which is right where I dropped them off. I pulled into a random parking spot several buildings away and turned off my car. I ducked in my seat. I should have called the police then and there, but I didn't think I was out of the woods just yet. But I was safe, ish. But I called a friend and broke down in tears explaining everything over the phone. Once the adrenaline had worn off, I started my car back up. No sign of anyone watching the gate or looking for me. I make a getaway and arrive home safely about half an hour later. I called the police and an officer was sent over to take my statement. I didn't expect anything to come of it. But I wanted the event on record in case there was retaliation. They knew where I worked because of my uniform, which also had my name prominently displayed as well as the car I drove. The officer asked me where I ended up taking them and from my vague description, he instantly knew the location. High crime area, lots of drug related incidents, great. I still drive that 2008 Corolla my next car will have electric locks. In my late teenage years, I came into some money after my father committed suicide and I received an inheritance from him. At the time of my father's passing, he and my mother owned a cabin up in Oregon by Mount Bachelor. The cabin had been put up for sale since my mother could no longer afford the payments. I'm renting it out. I'm renting it out would not cover the payments either. The cabin was set to go on the market for sale in less than a month. And I was in the process of finalizing all the paperwork with a realtor and the lawyer. So for that month's time, the cabin was not going to be rented out any longer and was going to be vacant. I saw this as a chance to get away for a while and clear my head in light of all the things that had been going on. I quit my job, packed up my snowboard gear, grabbed my dog and headed up in my dad's car, which he had willed to me. Now this was our family cabin that my parents rented out throughout the year when we were not using it. I had keys, as well as all the codes for the alarms, so I did not feel the need to inform the rental management company 
and advised them of my stay. My first two days at the cabin were normal, and nothing out of the unusual happened. I spent my days playing with my dog in the snow, snowboarding, and in the evenings playing PlayStation or listening to music, as well as drinking and smoking out on the balcony. I had already stocked up on food, cigarettes and liquor, so I was pretty much shut in aside from the occasional out to hit the slopes. With my dog as company and DVD slash PlayStation for entertainment, I was quite content and started to feel relaxed after all the drama that had preceded my outing. The cabin itself was two stories. Bottom story had the living room and the side guest bedroom, along with a small kitchen. The upstairs had another two rooms, along with a walkout balcony attached to the master bedroom. Most of my time was spent either in the living room, kitchen, or master bedroom. I never ventured into any of the other rooms, and always kept the doors leading into them shut. Anyway, the third day came around, and I was going through my usual routine of playing with my dog, his name is Midnight by the way, playing video games, and watching DVDs. That day, it was pretty heavy snowfall, so I did not feel like trekking down the hill to the main road in order to use my car, and decided to stay indoors. That's when things began getting a bit weird. In our area, there were only two other cabins adjacent to ours, maybe a block away from each other. All other cabins aside from these two, were around a mile away from ours, surrounding us was mostly forest and very tall pine trees. Both of these cabins had been empty for the past couple of days and I knew that no one was currently occupying them. Around midday, whilst outside with my dog, I noticed what looked like footprints in the snow around the area surrounding our cabin. It was still snowing, so the footprints looked semi-fresh as if someone had been there in the last half hour or so. I thought that maybe it was someone who was staying in a cabin near me, and that perhaps I hadn't noticed. Maybe they were shut-ins like me. Alright, whatever. The prints lead away from my cabin, and they disappeared into the snow towards the denser part of the trees. I disregarded the footprints, and went back inside. Night time came around, and I decided to head to bed. My dog Midnight was laying on the bed with me, when I noticed his ears perk up into a listening position. This was followed by him jumping quickly off the bed and running downstairs into the living room. I lay in bed and stayed silent. I could hear him moving around downstairs back and forth, and after around five minutes, he ran back upstairs to me and started to do his doggy dance as a sign that he had to pee or wanted to go outside. Shit. Well, fine. I can't say no to him. So we both went downstairs to go outside to the driveway for him to do his thing. Only, he didn't want to pee. As soon as we were outside, he started to pull on his leash trying to drag me to where he wanted to go. He kept looking into the denser part of the trees, where the prince had been earlier. But he also kept sniffing out on the side of the house, and looking up towards the roof. After he figured out that I was not going to go where he wanted me to, he sat himself down, and just stared into the darkness. This was a bit unusual for him, but perhaps there were animals out in the forest, and he fancied chasing them. I, however, was not in the mood for chasing any animals, so I pulled him back inside, and we both headed back upstairs. Around half an hour later, I was laying in bed when I heard what sounded like hooves walking on my roof. It was only a series of around six steps, and I rationalised that it could be a pine cone falling from a tree onto the roof 
or maybe a kind of hearted forest animal running around. But here's the thing. The steps seem to be spaced apart, like a man's length stride. So it was really freaking me out. Midnight was also hearing the noise and was quick to run to the balcony screen door with the expectation of me letting him out. All right, you know what? I'm a tough guy and at the time considered myself to be fairly well built and strong enough to handle myself. So I grabbed my coat and shoes along with my cigarettes and flashlight and went out to the balcony. As soon as I went outside, I lit up a cigarette and started canvassing on the roof with my light. Nothing there, and the snow on top was undisturbed. Weird. Could it have all been in my head? What about midnight hearing the noise? Could he be feeding off my paranoia? I started to calm down and relax again. And that's when my eyes started to adjust to the darkness. I kept smoking and just stared at the stairs and trees next to our cabin. And that's when I saw it. In a tree that was a little taller than our cabin, that was around 20 feet from the balcony, I saw what looked like a man crouched in a squatting position in between two branches. It was squatted on a branch and its arms were extended above its head, holding onto a branch above it. What the hell is that? I wasn't sure if I was really seeing this thing, and just stood there staring at it motionless. I noticed Midnight stand up and stare, pacing behind me, and lightly barking at the same time. The thing did not move. I put my cigarette out, and was debating on shining the light in the thing's direction. But something in my head kept screaming not to. So I walked backwards to the inside of the room and pulled Midnight out with me. Once I was indoors, I locked the door and shined the light in the thing's direction. But there was nothing there. I shut the curtains to the screen door and retreated to bed. But later on in the night, I heard tapping at the screen door, like someone was tapping the glass with their fingers. It was consistent and did not stop for nearly an hour. Midnight seemed to stare at the door, but he wouldn't go near it anymore. The weirdest part was I had a feeling as if someone was trying to invite me to open the door, but at the same time, I kept hearing my dad's voice in my head telling me to stay in bed and to not move. I listened to my dad's voice and just stayed there where I was. I eventually passed out and woke up in the morning and everything was normal. The rest of the week I spent there was non-eventful and nothing else out of the ordinary happened. I totally admit that it could have all been in my head. A lot of stuff had been going on and I was pretty messed up from all the drama. But still, how did Shadow know the thing was there if it was in my head? <laughs>